Okay, well, we talked a little bit in the preliminaries about um, brick walls a little bit, but we're gonna talk a lot more. And the concept here is that we have a series of classes. One was last week and this one's this week and it's called working through the alternatives and then there's resolving the outcome and the end of it is what to do after what you've already, after you finally find the information, what do you do, you know? you actually start over, but I didn't, you know, it's kind of discouraging. So I saved that one till last. Okay, so we're out there and we are wondering uh, where we're gonna go with this person who just absolutely seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth at some point in time, or we have a name that somebody passed down to us and we don't know, have any idea where it, where it is. Now, I'm gonna use the familysearch.org family tree for my examples because actually it's the best place to go for examples of all this stuff uh, because it's so co it's a cooperative, it's collaborative and it includes a lot of information that I don't, I haven't personally put in here. In other words, it's, it's a, con it's a, a mixture of all the people's input from all over the last hundred plus years. And um, you can assume that if something had, if uh, no information is available about somebody like Margaret Turner's father and mother, that a lot of people have spent a lot of time looking for her parents. And that's in my case, because we're back in 1790 with Margaret Turner, who's on there on the on the slide, and um, we don't know her parents. And I've been working off and on on all of these lines now for 40 years, and I don't know her parents. And I haven't found any records to tell me her parents. Now, so we're gonna kind of analyze why that occurs, how it occurs, and why if we click on, on out, we'll find this to be the real case in every every situation. Okay, so I have to give some credit here because some of the ideas for this series come from this book. It's uh, Jones, Ekel, and Christensen, Genealogical Research, a Jurisdictional Approach. I'm not recommending the book. I'm just saying this book had some ideas that helped me and a jurisdictional approach is, uh, was uh, kind of an innovation um, back 50 years ago, 40 years ago. And it is a way to uh, approach genealogy, which I think is fundamental. And I emphasize that by saying the place, the place, the place and location, location, location. So any discussion about anyone, uh, any person with me about an ancestor will end up with me asking the question, where did all this occur? If you tell me a specific location where this person lived or something happened in their life. And that's part of what this book has. Now, you could possibly find a book like this out online um, uh, for sale. Um, uh, but I'm not telling you to do that because basically the ideas here have been repeated over and over and over again. I'm just giving acknowledgement to this particular way that, that uh, and, and I have to acknowledge that Arlene Inkle is one of my good friends and has been for years. And so I know that I've it's been to her classes and everything. Okay, so the next thing is Remember, there are there is a difference between a brick wall and needing help finding additional places to look. Um, this this brings up a very important issue. The issue is, and and I'll go into that in more detail as I keep talking today, that the 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 biggest the thing we're most involved in is gen with genealogy is looking for places to look, is finding the additional uh, resources out there. Um, we always have to do that. That's a background thing. Um, uh, 
it, it's nice like today when I got doing some some research in the Netherlands that the people moved to England and then moved to the United States and I all of a sudden had US census records to work with and that was uh, that was pleasant uh, but uh, that doesn't always happen and many times we'll run out of information from a particular source and have to start looking for more and that's kind of the job we do as genealogists. Okay, so let's enumerate, and, and this is in somewhat of a, of, a, of a summary of what happened in the last class, but all of these classes will be online eventually when I finish the series. And, um, they're, and yes, there are a little bit uh, of uh, redundancy in the classes, but the redundancy is used to build some very important principles that need to be uh, addressed as we do our research. Okay, so the first one, oh, obvious one, you may be looking in the wrong place. Even though somebody said that this person was born in Germany, that doesn't mean they were really, really, really born in Germany. It means they may, and it doesn't even mean they spoke German. It may mean that they were born in some place in the German Empire, and I had that happen years ago. I've used this example on it on occasion uh, of, of being called over to look at uh, a find where a German ancestor lived, and and found out that the German ancestor spoke Hungarian and was from Hungary and not from Germany, and it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so. Don't automatically assume that because somebody says that your ancestor was born in Kentucky or Tennessee, that that's where they were born. They may really have been born, if they're early enough, they may have been born in Virginia or, or North Carolina. But on the other hand, they may also have been born in uh, someplace else. So don't, uh, don't assume these, uh, these, all of these places that, they, that you find are accurate. You may not have done enough research about the person's children. I find people coming to me with a brick line question and saying, well, I can't find this people. I've been looking for years for this person. And I look at what they have in their, in their family tree and they're part of the, of the family search family tree or on some other program. And I find out that they have nothing about the children. They just have maybe a list of names. Maybe they don't even have all the names of the children. And I go, oh, well, Okay, uh, first step in finding a, uh, in, in that you want to take when you go to look for your, your difficult to find ancestor is to open up your scope of, uh, you know, use a wide angle lens and pull out uh, more people, put in more people. And those people start with children, siblings, parents, uh, of course, you're not going to find the parents because it is, that's your brick wall. But they do include all the people in that in, in that lens, and they the parents really are in that. And somehow, you uh, if you get wide enough and you get enough information about the area, you may determine which of all these people they really were. And it may turn on uh, something as simple as a deed, or something as simple as a probate case. So that's, that's really an important thing to do. And so when I find that a lot of children, so the children have no sources and they have just one or two dates and they're all deceased instead of having death dates and things like that, I say, well, okay, you really do need to have all this information about the children because you may be looking in the wrong place and the latter children in this family may have been born someplace else and they died someplace else than where you're looking. That's the simplest explanation. The person could have changed his or her name. Uh, names were not changed automatically by the US government when people came to America. That was not, that was never has been and, and is not everything that has ever happened. People do change their names when they get here. Sometimes they translate their, their other language other than English language name into English and use that. Sometimes they simply Americanize their name and drop uh, the uh, skis and, and sins and things that may have been on there. 
And um, in addition, you've always have to remember that the woman may have had a married name of a previous marriage, and there may be a previous marriage. Um, sometimes the women, woman is, is young enough that you, you wouldn't suspect that, but it's possible. And so you need to understand that, that uh, name is, uh, names are what we call fungible. They can be changed easily from one form to another. Okay, so there may not be any records for the time or place the person lived. Yes, we have to, um, uh, and you're getting dishes. Can you shut the door, please? They're hearing dishes. Okay, I'll get Anne to shut the door. Now there's not gonna be dishes. Sorry about the dishes. There may not be any records for the time and place the, uh, and or place the person lived. And so basically, you know, there, there's, that's kind of the way things worked. Um, the further you go back in time, the less records were, fewer records were kept and the less information you're going to be able to find. And so when you get to that, uh, the thresholds here are, uh, are pretty obvious. Not, it, it, is, it is usually not a, a, a really overwhelming problem, although there are some in the 1800s, there, but there's far fewer than there are if you go back to the 1700s. And at, once you pass that 1700 threshold, you're into a whole different world. You're into a world where people had limited means of travel and had little, extremely limited means of communication. And so the fact that an immigrant got to the United States uh, and never, never had contact with, the, with his or her family back in the old country is, is not unusual at all. And when you get down to the 1600s, everybody starts to disappear. And the 1500s is like the brick is like the ultimate brick wall, and that is that unless you are willing to accept the concept of learning an entirely new language, no matter which language you start with, and also willing to get into um, uh, handwriting systems that are are entirely foreign to what you may have, have seen previously and are willing to spend a great deal of time learning the history of all of the different locations you're doing research, that you're probably not going to be real uh, successful in, in moving back before the 1500s. The person named in your records may not actually exist. Okay, people do make up names and they may put them in there and thinking, well, I'm sure that man's name was John and his last name's gotta be the same, so. Yeah, no, well, that does, does happen. I'm sorry, but it does. Don't become obsessive about an apparent brick wall or ancestor or relative. I, I hear too many stories and too frequently, I hear people say over and over again, well, I've spent years trying to find this person. I can't just can't find this person. I can't find this person. There may be a very, very simple reason why you can't find the person, there's no records or that the person you're looking for, any of the things I just listed. And any of those would, would just say, you're not even going to ever find that person, ever, 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 no matter how much you, records you get. And then there's the other question that was raised before uh, the class started, and that is, um, uh, do you run out of records and trying to find a birth record or a marriage record or a death record? Well, the, the problem there is that what we call vital records, which includes those, those three categories and a few more, really aren't things that people kept. They're not things that had any particular, um, you know, any particular, they, they simply were not interested in keeping track of the average person who lived and died in the area where people were living and dying. And so you just have to realize that, that uh, being obsessive is not a good idea. And I would suggest uh, looking more, looking look at broader lines. Um, 
uh, Annapolis, for example, we have Joseph, James Hamilton and Margaret Turner up here again, and she's missing her parents. Um, and this is in, in Nicholas County, Kentucky in 1810, and they're getting married in 1810. Well, Kentucky became a state in 1892. So they're very early in statehood. What do you think? Who do you, who do you think was living in Kentucky in 1810? no matter if Nicholas County is one of the eastern counties, which it is. But the question is, where were they? They weren't living in a city. There were no cities. They were living out in the forest, and they were living in forts, or they were living in very small communities. By 1810, it was not very well settled. And so you're looking at, uh, you're, you're really going to need to look at land records. You're really going to have to start looking at, at the movement of the, of the people in that community to find out which turners. It may turn out that uh, as you do research, and if I were to do this more extensively on this line, that uh, the turners were a family that came, uh, that came to that area and there might be some information about that movement, but maybe not. Okay, so here we have James Hamilton and Margaret Turner again. Of course, we don't know who Margaret Turner's parents are, but we have 11 listed children. And out of those 11 just listed children, three of the children have no sources attached in family search. And that generally means that we really don't know if that person existed and there are no records that anyone has uh, bothered to look at or attach that show that that person was really part of this family. And so this was an emphasis on really on starting research with the children. Um, the question you might ask is, well, why haven't you solved this problem and why haven't you put in the information about the children? The answer is in the numbers and the time of my life at them. Um, this and other and otherwise, and another reason is just purely, purely, purely personal, is that this line is being you is being researched by a lot of different people, and has been for years. And so, I am not in. I I. I sometimes leave these because I need bad examples or examples. But in other hands, there's always something out there. It, it wouldn't matter which line I pick. I would still be able to find as an example of this exact same thing with, um, with something that was already in the family tree and had been in the family tree for years and years. OK. But important is that considering Margaret Turner to be a brick wall is absolutely premature. It is just not a fact. She is not a brick wall person. She is a lack of information and lack of research person. And with all of these children, you would think that we would be able to somehow find some records from one or two of her descendants that might have mentioned who and where her, her family came from. And that's very possible, but it just hasn't. It's just one of those ends of lines out there on family search that have yet to gain the attention of someone who can actually um, spend the time to do the research and uh, find the actual records that exist. So the first of all, this is another principle. The best source for information about the parent is from researching the children. So especially the earlier children. The more you can find out about your, your ancestors that are, were born earlier, your relatives and cousins and things that were born earlier in the family, the more likely you are to be able to find out the information you're looking for for the parents of the family. And that's that, that just is, you know, it's just obvious thing. Okay, now we're going to kind of shift, shift uh, uh, to
to over to a little bit of a different topic here. This is, this is talking specifically about the concept of jurisdictions. If you happen to have a law background, then you're very much acquainted with the idea of jurisdictions and you understand what a jurisdiction is. But uh, the word itself is a little bit uh, formidable and it's used all the time for a, a lot of different purposes. But in our case with genealogy, what we're looking at at jurisdictions are geographic areas of social and or governmental units of authority. And their records are created by and maintained in an appropriate jurisdictions. And the records can be moved from jurisdiction to jurisdiction over time. Okay, so let me give examples of those three things. A jurisdiction, for example, would be uh, a, a county. Uh, any county. So let's say Utah County. And the records that are created by and maintained in the appropriate jurisdiction. So the records that are gathered by Utah County are jurisdictional records in Utah County. But there are other places too. There's Utah, state of Utah. There's other surrounding counties. Uh, there are government agencies that cross county lines, like national forests. So we have national records. And then we have other kinds of jurisdictions, like regulatory agencies and, uh, and fraternal organizations and churches. And all of these may have different areas of interest and be gathering records from different areas. That's, that's the idea here of jurisdictions. So what is the jurisdiction of a church? It may be the parish or in the case of, of uh, whatever the division, the, the, uh, the geographical division is made in that particular, in the particular religion. And records are created and, main, and maintained in the appropriate jurisdiction. So if you have a record of your military service in the United States Armed Forces, you're not going to find it at the county in the county. It's just not going to be there. It never would have been there. It wasn't there, and it isn't going to be there in the future. That isn't to say that there might not be some record of your military service in some county record, but that does not mean they have the responsibility for taking and keeping that information. You'd have to go to the United States government and the and the US archives and the specific area of the US archives in St. Louis where they maintain military records and and other places around the country where other military records are kept. So those that's one area. But you're sitting here in in a county like wherever you are and in the world. And uh, you can think of all the different organizations, governmental organizations that you may have to deal with. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, jurisdiction, a jurisdictional approach to genealogy focuses on the time and the place, and then focuses on all of the possible jurisdictional entities that could have maintained records about that time and place. And then understanding that once the records are created, they might be able, they, they might be moved. Counties are divided, uh, cities disappear, uh, places get renamed, um, state boundaries are changing currently in the United States, but foreign, foreign uh, boundaries do have changed uh, considerably over the last hundred years. So, there's lots of different things here, but the concept here is to focus on these jurisdictions and focus on the records that are created in these jurisdictions. This is a quote directly out, and I decided I'd, I'd attribute it to uh, uh, the genealogical research of jurisdictional approach. Researchers are totally dependent on preserved records. Now you need to think about that for a while because what it says is that unless this record is preserved, it's not going to be available for someone in the future to get information. 
That means if it's destroyed, if it's unavailable because of, of whatever reason, it's not being kept in a place where anybody can access it, access it, or if it's basically, um, if, if it's unavailable in, a, in some kind of form that you can, you can actually use. So for instance, now we're highly dependent on digitized records online. That's where we spend a considerable amount, practically all of the time we spend on that. But that's kind of a um, that's kind of an illusion. That's that's uh, not really true. It's more of a mirage. We're seeing a lot of of digital records online, and therefore we think there are a lot of digital records online. But if we penetrate that and go through to the reality, the reality is that that a lot of these records are still sitting in courthouses and on shelves and in archives and have yet to be digitized. And so we're still we still have that that possibility of, of going out. Now, for most purposes, let's say we find 20 sources about a person. Maybe we're satisfied with that. Maybe we don't think we need to add any more sources. Well, we might have to if that person was as a brick wall. We might have to get as many more sources as we can find. Another definition is that significant genealogical records are produced at or near the time of an event by those who witness the event or have a duty to report it. Now think through that. What it means is we, we, we want to find significant records. Uh, you might wanna call them primary records or you can use legal terms you know, for, for defining the types of records, but that, that isn't really helpful. What we're really looking for is information that we can identify to have been collected by either somebody who was there at the time and can relate the, the, the event or someone who reported the event because they had to, like a court clerk or a um, uh, county recorder or someone else. In other words, someone who just took the information and has the information um, uh, second hand in a sense because they weren't really there but they rely on the information that's in the record to uh, to be accurate and correct so these are sometimes called primary records as opposed to secondary records and everything else is secondary records so anything that isn't primary record is a secondary record uh, as long as you understand the division, and there are some, you know, law has some nuances of divisions uh, of, of how reliable a record can be. But uh, in, in genealogy, if it isn't a, if it isn't a primary source record or what you would what I call a significant genealogical record, and it doesn't wasn't created at or near the time of the event then there's always a possibility that the information that was contained in the record or is contained in the record is not accurate. So we need to, uh, it's, it's a little messier, like this picture is a little messier than, uh, than the one that we had pre that I had previously. Okay, so records are found in the jurisdictions that were in existence at the time they were created and may move as, jur as jurisdictions change. This is another way of saying that records can move from one place to another. But they're also, uh, it's important, it emphasizes the importance of focusing on the name, not the name so much as that, that's, that's the substitute, but the actual designation of the jurisdiction at the time that the event occurred. Okay, so this becomes so more, much more crucial when you move outside of the comfort zone here in the United States of America. If you go out to uh, some other location uh, in the world, then it becomes a real issue. It becomes a tremendously difficult situation in some cases to determine which country, which entity had control over this particular piece of the world, this particular point on the map 
at the time that my ancestor lived there. Who was in charge? And who kept the records? And assuming that the records were kept by the current person, entity, or whatever they are, that that uh, is responsible for that little piece of pro that little point on the map is 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 where you start to lose track of reality and where you're floating out there in space and you're never going to find this information because you have never folk you've never found a place to have it tethered so that you don't float off so you're you're really out there if you don't think in terms of jurisdictions and and where where did these where did these things occur not not generally speaking but where they actually occurred and then that will help to to establish so for example uh i can take this example uh let's suppose uh, from that uh, earlier slide i showed that we were talking about a county, a county, uh, a county in Kentucky. Well, that county uh, was sort of undefined in 1810, and by 1830 or 1840, it probably was divided into uh, many other counties. And so, the records that that have been looked for in that particular county in Kentucky may be scattered someplace else in the whole in the whole state. And you just don't know that until you dig into it. And they may not even be in any of the counties. They may be in an archive or a special collections uh, library at a university, or they might be in a, in a historical society, or they might have gone all sorts of different places. So, uh, but you're never going to find them if you keep assuming that the place where you need to look is right there, and that's all you're going to look for because that's what it said, that's the person, that's where they were married, or that's where they were born, and that's where they died. And so you're going to only search for records there, and the answer is, your guy may have never moved. They may have been born there, died there, married there, and died on the same farm in their whole life, but they may have lived in five different states and three different, in 10 different counties. Or if they were in Europe, they may have lived in at the same time period, they may have lived in five different countries who claimed the land. Okay. It's essential to search all the existing records produced by all the jurisdictions that had authority over your ancestral families. I, I have too many people who, uh, who say, well, I looked in that record and I couldn't find the date, I couldn't find the person at that time, period. Well, all that means is that now what you've got to do is start looking through page by page of every one of the records before, years before the event and years after the event to make sure that, that, that the record was not put in the wrong part of the record or that it was year, the year that you were thinking that it occurred it was actually not correct or whatever. So the answer is that you, the, all the records mean all the records you can ever get your hands on. If you, you spend, like I said, we're going back to the point that um, what we're looking for is all the records and when we think of all the records, we think of, yeah, there's more records out there than I probably haven't seen. I haven't looked at all the church records in that area. I haven't looked at probate records. I haven't looked at, I haven't read through every year, page by page of the town records from the time the town was created. Well, you may not need to do that, but in, I have found in my case, that that was the only way that I had any way of finding the information that I needed to find. That's it. And um, I just <clears throat> recently got a little bit of uh, uh, carpal tunnel in my arm and, and muscle from clicking through 
thousands of pages of documents. So I, I can, I know what it's like. I know what we're talking about. It's, it's what we do. And that's what it really means. It does really mean that. It means that you'll have to learn a lot about the sources that are available. Not just learn a little bit, <clears throat> but you need to learn a, <clears throat> a lot. And this includes, by the way, in shifting and kind of moving a little to a different kind of focus here, it includes the law online gen genealogy and non-genealogy um, databases out there that contain historical information, okay? So uh, learning to do genealogy is not something that you can start to do today and by tomorrow you've got it down and you pass the test and you get your license and then you do genealogy. Genealogy is an ongoing process of learning about records and learning about sources and learning of skills of reading different kinds of handwriting and learning perhaps languages and all of the things that go along with, with developing uh, genealogy. And I say, and we'll repeat it continually, is that if it wasn't challenging, if it wasn't difficult, I wouldn't be doing it because I would be, I would have been lost interest, uh, you know, long, long time ago. If it turned out to be or something that was just everybody did and it was really easy, I mean, I just give up on that. I give up on the easy things because they just I just don't have enough time to focus on stuff that that's easy. And uh, my category, of course, of easy is probably not the same as yours, so don't worry about it. Okay, the main activity is discovering and locating records. Do I have to repeat that again? <laughs> In other words. It, it, this is this is kind of where my frustration level comes out because I talk to people and I know that there are a, a number of very large billions of records websites out there online and they are Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage, Find My Past, and by the way, Ancestry just bought uh, Filet, the French, the French website and and my heritage just bought the other french website that i can't bring in dredge out of my head right this second so they're now got a lot of french records both uh, ancestry and my heritage will probably start getting lots and lots of french records and probably helping to beef up these other little programs but they'll be you know they'll be all over the place with records so what happening out there is that I talk to people and they say, well, yeah, I, I, I don't really know that much about my heritage. I haven't ever used it. I haven't ever looked at it. Well, yeah, and, and don't, okay, so don't talk to me about the fact that you haven't found, found something uh, or that you're, you're missing your ancestors. Um, here's a good example. An example is that your ancestors come from a country that you know that there is uh, almost nothing that you can find to have records. And let's say it's something like um, uh, you have difficulty in, in getting records in Estonia, up there in the Baltics. And so you're, you, you can't, you don't know what, you don't have no idea where to go to get some record in Estonia. And, and once you start looking at it, they're really hard to get to, and you really have a difficult time. Fine. My answer to that is take a DNA test on my heritage. And if you think your ancestors came from Estonia, and put your family tree as much as you possibly can, can find onto my heritage, and let them connect you with some one of your potential relatives in Estonia. And then work with the relatives to get additional information where they're there speaking the language and they have, they know where the records are and if they exist. And Google Translate is a wonderful tool because you can send letters to people and emails to people in whatever language and it will come across pretty well understood and you can carry on conversations. So, you know, this is, it's just, 
that part of our activity here is to break away from the idea that you're going to spend your whole life looking at records on family search and uh, start to branch out to a lot of different areas. Once you find the record, remember to extract all the data about all your ancestral surnames from the record. So when you find a, 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 a census record in the United States, make sure you read all up and down in that town and find if there's any other of your, your cousins who live there. And if there are, then forget about that family for a while and, and add in all the other information and everything else you get out of that particular record. And I find a lot of times um, a missing birth record or death record in uh, family search and look at the sources and find out that there's a source already attached that has the, the birth or death record. And the person hasn't even, uh, whoever put the source in hasn't uh, taken the moment's time to uh, add that information into the, the, the family tree itself. Understanding that family trees are a way of communicating. And if you aren't a communicator, if you're the person who says, mm, I don't really talk to anybody, I don't really wanna talk to anybody, I don't wanna deal with people, okay, that's fine. But that isn't, it isn't genealogy. Genealogy is by its very nature, a interacting communicative um, area of, of interest, of research. And what we, what we find is that as we get out there, is we can talk to other people who may or may not have the information we're looking for, but that reinforces our our efforts to find our information because we can understand what they have to say. And, and you have to be a good listener. You have to have a pretty high level of tolerance to listen to people tell you about their four generations or five or six generations of research that they've done. But when you do that, that's the, that's the basis of it. And when you get online and put your family tree on the family search family tree, you're communicating your, what you know to the world and you're asking for input. And when you get the input, you shouldn't be upset. You should accept that for what it is. And the input may not be pleasant and it may not be what you're looking for, but that's part of the process of being out there and communicating. Always work from the known to the unknown. And what I find is that many people don't really know what they know. They really know more than they think they know because they haven't looked at the records in sufficient detail to really understand what they're saying and who these people were and what they were. Uh, one of the simplest examples of this is occupations. People have a variety of occupations. They have, uh, you know, they, they, some of them are really obscure as you get back in time. And occupations help to identify the individual, especially if you have a Tom Smith or a uh, Roger Jones or someone with a name that's, that's a, you know, a Jose Gonzalez or something like that, where your, your name is so common that it it's, almost seems impossible to to try to differentiate. But then people don't all keep the, have the same jobs with the same names. So every bit of information that you add makes it more specific and more likely that you found and that you have uh, gone through that brick wall and found the right person. Now, to qualify that, when I say the known, the known that you know is not what you know in your head. It's not what your grandmother told you or what your great aunt gave you in, a, uh, in an oral history, but it's, it, it's, a, it's what is actually available from genealogical sources, so, uh, sources that support your, the events in your ancestors' lives. So in other words, if you if you don't if if you think 
oh, well, this is the story. And they got to this town and they, uh, they set up this and they did this and they did this. The answer is, yeah, that's, that's interesting information. It's a nice story. It may make you feel good, it may make you happy. But the whole problem is, is that you need to take that framework of that story and that, and that information and nail it down make sure that you have found a genealogical source that, that tells you what happened with this person. And a good example is this death certificate for my great grandfather, Henry Martin Tanner, who I never knew because he died in 1935. And he died at a rather advanced age. He was 82 years old. And I don't, I'm slowly beginning to understand that that's not an advanced age, but you know, it's probably is. Um, and what happened was he fell down the stairs in his daughter's house, the basement stairs. They were concrete stairs and he fell down, hurt his head, died from a, from a, a injury to his head when he was uh, 82 years old. So uh, this is kind of story. Okay, so there's the story, but but the the fact that it's on the birth on the death certificate here helps to fasten it down. It gives it a a date, a time, and a place where he died. He didn't die immediately. He died after a period of time, and uh, so there's uh, you know it's just it's just uh, it, it helps to get the to get away from. Uh, the, oh, my ancestors were poor and they came from Ireland and they ended up in America. Yeah, but when was it? When were they poor in Ireland and came to America? What was the time period involved? What was going on in Ireland at that time? And why did they leave? And how did they, where did they come to, to where did they come to America? All of those things are kinds of questions that are need to be need to be supported by genealogical sources. If they don't exist, they don't exist. We live on that. We live with that. We don't get obsessive because they don't exist. Okay. So one of the one of the things that I always said is that research, genealogical research, and jurisdictional research is like a pile of pancakes your lowest level is the locality, the farm, the house, the building that they lived in. The next one up is the next jurisdiction level. It, it's a local level. So it's going to be the city or the town or the school district or the tax district or the whatever else was the jurisdictional that was involved in that particular location. And then you go up to another pancake and you get another set of records. These are all different sets of records. They don't, they're not all the same thing. You're looking in different, in different jurisdictions, you're looking at different levels and the records are not the same. They maintain that you may have some record that carries that, that goes through all of these different levels, but they're not all the same. And every one of these records may give you additional information. And then working your way up, you have larger areas, townships, can counties. Then you work up to states. And then you get into national levels. And then you have even more records that may be international records and records of, of uh, uh, that have really no con direct relationship to uh, either the country of your your person, your uh, ancestors' origin or the arrival country. When they came to America, they may have come on a. They may be from Germany, but they may have come on a British ship. They may have come to America, and they may have left from from uh, it been from Denmark but they may have come to England first and they may have come across on an English ship. And so the records are not are extra national in a sense. They don't have anything to do with Denmark or the United States where they ended up. They have to do with the country that was 
keeping those particular records at that time. So all was recorded from the smallest to the most restrictive to the largest. Just remember that, that's always the rule. So you, you've got to sort out the, the size, the, the small, lower genealogic, the lower jurisdictions, the ones that deal with homes and houses and farms and buildings, and then move up to the next level, school districts, municipalities, parishes, those kinds of things, and then keep moving up, but always record them. And we're recording on our system of Roman, lang Roman characters is from left to right. Obviously, if you're from Israel and you're doing it in, in Hebrew, do it from right to left. But that's just what we happen to. So this is an example of how this works in one, a real quick example. So I look for a place. That's the first thing I'm going to look for when I go to, a, to the family search catalog and any other catalog. I'm going to look for the place for of where my people lived where the event occurred in their lives, that place right there. So here I've taken Mexico, for example. And now I have this level of records and it's actually coming down from the top of the pile of pancakes. This is the higher, highest level of records in Mexico. These are governmental, Mexican governmental records kept on a national level. Okay, and then the next step is to go to places within Mexico. So you look in the catalog and here's the Mexican states, the states within Mexico. And so now you're down to another layer, layer of records. And so these records are helpful. So then we go to click on places, that's the places within Mexico and we choose a place. In this case, we're gonna choose Guanajuato. And now, we have places within Mexico, Guanajuato. And these are primarily, in this case, in this example, they're parishes, they're Catholic church parishes. Uh, they could be civil parishes. Some of them are, and there's a mixture. Sometimes in the catalogs, they mix up the two. So they, you have civil parishes, which are uh, sort of like counties or townships. And then you have uh, ecclesiastical parishes, which are divisions within the within the church. And the Catholic Church is not the only church that has parishes. Um, in, the, the, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we call them wards. And we call the diocese stakes. And we move up to larger areas, just like some of the other churches do. And in Protestant churches, they call them conferences, and they'll call them and they things like that. So there's different names. But this is, this is an example of what you would run into if you said your ancestor came from Guanajuato. You would not. Yeah, the answer is, well, where in Guanajuato did this person come from? You want to look through all these records? There's probably a few hundred thousand, maybe a million of them in this, in this collection. Okay, so then what do we do? We choose a place in Guanajuato. Let's say this person came from Serrano. Okay, so now we're down to manageable records, but we're, we have a different level of records than we had when we started. And so there's going to be Guanajuato records, there's going to be Mexico records, and there's gonna be Serrano records. And if your person came from Serrano in Guanajuato, they, and the time period is available, then they probably will be in these records. So in the United States, a general search would look at US records, military, tax, um, licensing, anything that happened on a, on a national basis out there. And, and it's, it's sometimes it being familiar, becoming familiar with the records lets you understand where those locations, how those locations work. And then a specific search would look for a particular record in a particular location. So there are general searches and there are uh, they give you an idea of, of what kinds of records might be available, uh, where the records might be located. And then you're going to have to go to one of these counties 
to uh, find the records that you're actually looking for. And you may have to go down to a town in one of these counties to get those records. And don't forget general Google searches. They're always helpful. It gives you kind of a perspective of how much information may have been accumulated about your person out there, how much research has been done and how much, how many, how much information there may be out there about that person. It could be nothing like I've had today, or it could be thousands of documents, depending on the person you're looking for. So this is kind of a, 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 an ending sort of um, concept here. When you contemplate research in a particular place or country, learn about it before you start trying to get frustrated and looking for records. Take a moment to learn about the records that are available. Um, I'm, this example I'm using is Ancestral Trails. It's about, I think, between five and 600 pages long, but it's the most exhaustive listing of all of the types of records that are available in uh, Great Britain and England and uh, the British Isles that you'll find any place. So it's, it's, a, it's, you know, and it's a reference type book. It, uh, I think it costs like 50 to 60 bucks online. So it's not something you just casually buy, but it may, in, in the end, if you get into this kind of thing, save you uh, a lot more than 50 or 60 bucks worth of time and effort if you're starting out trying to learn about something like this. And I always like to remind people that the Family History Guide has, uh, has convenient links to the basic record sources in most genealogically significant countries. So if you want to learn about the records in any of these countries, all you have to do is go to the Family History Guide, the fhguide.com, and um, choose a country, and you'll have uh, a good introduction and a good basis for uh, going on with your research. Okay, thanks for watching.